oh, those are my calling frequencies, so I have to call down King 9 100% frequency, right? No matter what. But they never ask, is my opponent really capable of bluff showing all those hands on the river? Is this reality? <laughs> and super often, this is not reality, right? Welcome. Today I will be introducing you our cash game co uh, coaches Fallout and Cold Smile. Thank you guys for joining me. If you don't know them, both of them are very active in the Raise Your Edge community and we're also about to launch a new cash game course. So we want to take the opportunity here to um, yeah, introduce them to you and to so you have the chance to get them know a little bit better we're also going to go over a few hands and the boys also going to have the chance to share some information what this course is about and what makes it different to most of the cash game courses that might be out there and yeah just just sharing some nuggets and later on also sharing uh, some wisdom I don't think we don't necessarily want to bore our audience too much and in, in, in the way you started playing poker and I think most of you guys want to know what you guys um, are capable of, your your knowledge, your experience. I mean, Fallout, you have been poker strategy coach for a very long time, the flagship of poker strategy, so to speak, and Colts might now yeah. also... Um, raise your edge coach and you have been also very active in the poker strategy community producing videos uh, also for the raise your edge community uh, exclusively actually that's not public right your cash game videos and you guys decided to team up so tell us what do you think makes this course uh worse for the audience to or for everyone that might be interested in stepping up their they game in, in investing in that course so what we did um when we first had the idea of making a course um that there was a global need of um, a solid fundamental game plan that should be available for everyone and this includes pre-flop game plan and post-flop game plan so um, we thought we could make something out of all the problems our students come up with um, because every student kind of has the same issues or the same ways of struggling. Mm -hmm. For example, three bad pots, um, playing pots against the big blind, barreling, um, blockers, um, pre-flop three bad only approach is a huge thing. When to cold call, when not to cold call. And what do we do when we three bet all of our hands and don't have any cold calls available, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so what we, what we try to do here is um, to make a big safety net based on GTO fundamentals, but keep, us, keep it as simple as possible because only simple strategies and simplified strategies will be um, ex executable in game. Yeah. Um, and this will be like um, where the, all the confidence comes from. Um, difficult scenarios explained very, very easily, broken down into easy and simplified strategies um, to give the player or the student all the confidence he needs, starting with pre-flop and then going over all the post-flop stuff that can occur in a session, basically. You, you mentioned earlier that um, a big focus are also three bet pots. Is it something that you have realized people do wrong and don't necessarily feel so comfortable in playing? So that's why um, <clears throat> you wanted to dive deeper into three bet pots. Yeah, yeah because... for sure, for sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think well, when you ask a student, what is your main problem? He's always coming up with three pots in position, but mainly out of position. They have no clue what they should do, right? Which boards to see bet, which boards to check call, do I see bet range, do I check range on various board textures? So yeah, we um, explained everything fairly easy on which board textures you can do what. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is definitely a huge, huge leak from a lot of our students. And that's why we focused on this point a lot. What do you think if we, um, if we already teaser a little bit on on what the content is going to be about what is what is the main leak that most people have in three bad pots 
Yeah, they don't really have the confidence in knowing what they're doing or in knowing what their range looks like. Um, and I always say this, when you have a three-bit only approach, the huge benefit is that you exactly know what your preflop range looks like because, because you don't have to worry about any form yeah. of cold calling. Um, and then when you take that range and go to post-flop, it gets way easier to break down which hands want to do what or what hands have what kind of job. Yeah. And the, the easy thing about three bed pots is it's super easy to simplify. You can always simplify them to one bed sizing on the flop and then go from there. For example, yeah. there would be a bed sizing for small with your whole range or a half pot <clears> or even 75% pot or even some ex um, exotic things like betting pot on the flop yeah. will happen too. But yeah, it's always one sizing and then you know exactly what you are doing yeah. And um, when you don't know what you're doing and you're like, okay, I check some hands, um, I, um, uh, I check call some hands, I check raise some hands, and then suddenly all of a sudden you don't really know what kind of game tree you're looking at and where you are in your range and what you're even doing. And if, you've, if the student doesn't know what he's doing, like how, how do we or how should we know what he's doing? So we try to yeah. simplify that um, to the maximum um, and then go from there. Yeah, I think the main problem is usually that they see that way too much or not enough because they don't know what their range looks like. This is what um, what um, Kozmai was talking about. And yeah, I think we um, did a good job in simplifying the strategies that yeah. everyone is able to use them. Yeah, I was just about to say, I feel like there are two player types. The one player type is, oh, I'm the aggressor, so I always have to see bet. You know, that yeah, kind of always fantasy. Always have main advantage, right? Yeah, I, just because I re-raised, that means I will have the range advantage and they don't really take various board te textures into consideration. And exactly. they're actually boards where we want to be checking a bunch. And then you have that type of player who's like, oh my God, he caught my three bet, so his range is really strong. So I should be very careful. And then he starts checking back way too much. So I've seen both player types and you, you want to find a middle way in identifying what are the board textures where we want to be very aggressive. And especially out of position, I've seen actually lots of overbedding on on boards where you want to make it a two street game, right? You actually want to take the positional advantage away from your opponent. I've seen that, let's say a typical example would be Jack 10 five. If you have pocket Queens, you want to get Ooh. it in on the flop. You see a bunch of overbedding on these boards. Like if you have ace, Jack pocket Queens, your King Queen, um, where you want to bet big on the flop and then shove on good turns. But like if you bet small and then you bet turn, you, you really have to pray for getting a, a decent run out on turn and rivers, right? And this is where a lot of players are not aware on how strong your range on Jack 10 actually is because it connects very well with your bluffs. You have your ace jacks, king jacks, Jack 10s. Uh, your opponent very often doesn't have queens, kings, aces. He has a lot of like suited aces, which we are not three betting 100% frequency. He has a lot of like fours, pocket sevens. So he really struggles defending against the large sizing. And then, but it would be much easier against a small bet. And identifying that, just, you know, look at range A, our three betting range, and look at range B, our opponent's defending range, and let's look at the board texture. And we actually see how much equity we have on this board and how many strong hands you have it's going to be so much easier. Then you can mirror it onto 10-9x, queen-10x, right? And, and so many of these similar board textures. And you know the perfect strategy for all of these board textures that are like middling kind of connected boards, right? Of course, it gets different when the board becomes 7-8-5, but you can also identify patterns and then you can mirror it to 9-6-5, 7-5-4, right? It's, it's not such a big difference than playing these board textures. We just categorize, and I think this is something you guys are also uh, uh, doing very well, and, and and that's why I love working with you guys because you do a great job in simplifying, and I can see that feedback in our community on a daily basis that everyone um, <coughs> really appreciates your simplistic approach because at the end of the day, studying and the theory is already so intricate enough that if you try to complicated even more in-game when emotions are coming into play you have no chance and then you get overwhelmed you don't know what to do and also usually you won't have that aha moment and uh, what am i supposed to do here or um yeah it basically yeah, exactly. I mean, what you've when, learned. You, when you start out right it's important to cluster flops together it's not mm -hmm. that every single flop is different you have to cluster flop together this is i don't know low suited board right this is um yeah, high cut heavy 
um, monotone board, whatever, right? You have to cluster those flops together. Yeah. Otherwise, it's so complicated. Um, find the correct solution, and you're just looking at the GTO tree over and over again, but you're never able to apply those concepts in game. That's yeah. why it's so important to simplify. Yeah, yeah, and sure. that's that's what I would suggest as well. When we work with solvers uh, in the course, um, everything is based on solvers. Obviously, this is our our base where we um, start from and where we can always rely and fall back on as a safety net. But we want to like find rules and patterns in those solutions to take away for our own game to apply them in game and not really try to copy as um, Fallout said um, the solver output blindly and just try to uh, yeah nail the frequencies and then pat ourselves <laughs> on the back and we could do so much better by just exploiting our player pool by um, finding some cool rules yeah. and some cool patterns we should use. Yeah, because no one can remember the exact frequencies on every single runout. That's that's absolutely ludicrous when I study with people or students and then they start to break down the frequencies and I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing? Do you think you're yeah, ever going to be able to apply the, the frequencies in-game? And it just blows my mind. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, but yeah, exactly. All right. Um, we are going to share, of course, more information on when the course is going to be released, the pricing. You'll find more information in the description if you're interested. Um, if not, you can just skip this part. And now we're going to be diving into some hands. Um, the first hand here, I will bring it on the screen. One second. The Ace-5 suited. Um, one second. Uh, can you send the weak tight link again, please? Yeah, for sure. Wait, it's it's in. Uh... I got it. Okay. So, Ace-5 suited, button opens, we 3 bet to $21, King-6-6, six, six. you decide to C-bet, is it standard for you, is it... So yeah, this hmm? this hands looks a bit strange or a little bit weird when we like go over street by street and see myself not having a, any kind of equity or any kind of uh, relevant uh, cards um, in comparison to the board but that's what i was or what we were referring to um, earlier about um, having rules and patterns um, getting that out of the solver and then try to um, implement that into, into our game so on king six six um, the king is a pretty good card for me. Um, I have king queen, I have king jack, I have ace king, I have pocket aces, pocket kings, obviously. Um, the button um, lacks ace king and pocket kings. Um, he calls ace king sometimes, I think, a small frequency just to have it in there. Um, and the six is a little bit better for the in position player because he has 100% of six seven and six five, and I only have like 25 to 30. Um, but then again, um, with one high card and two low cards, this always favors a little bit the aggressor, so the um, out of position player in this case, yeah. which is me. So I can go for a full range bet with a small sizing. I choose like quarter pot, which I think um, does the job um, pretty well of denying equity. Um, he folds hands like 10-9 um, suited right away and there are enough hands in his range that puke to that sizing. Um, on the turn, I basically have to decide um, how good are my blockers and how relevant are blockers on the turn. So I either want to have diamonds um, because I want to have a pretty um, good river bluff if a diamond rolls off yeah. and I want to bet my flush shot on the, on the turn two. If I don't have diamonds, I absolutely want to have hearts yeah. for multiple reasons. Um, hearts um, unblock the backdoor flush draws that my opponent floats against my small siding. So the ace jack of spades, the ace jack of clubs, ace queen suited uh, of the same suit. Uh, this sounds a bit complicated, but it makes sense, right? Ace because 10 spades, he... ace 10 clubs, yeah, something exactly. like ace 9 and clubs. If, exactly. Yes. And if I want to bluff the turn, I, I don't want to have any kind of those hands that bluff his folding range on the turn. So hearts is really, really good. And the five of hearts is really, really good too, because I block one combo of six, five suited. Yeah. Um, which makes him have a little bit less nuts. And, and also an ace, ace six is, suited. 
a6 suited as well okay. and i have an overcut with the king so i even can improve on some rivers when i hit my ace and uh, can maybe even value a bit against this king queen king jack type of hands yeah um so i got so on the turn it's pretty clear my plan um to uh, follow through if the river is basically not a diamond because i think uh, my blockers are a bit bad then um, but on bricks um, I think I have to follow through and the 10 is even a little bit better because I also block a screen now mm -hmm. have all the a screen combos myself yeah um, still have the five six blockers and then I follow through unfortunately yeah. um, this time it goes wrong uh, King Jack pretty easy call for my opponent but I don't think he loves the life I think he expect to uh, lose this sometimes too I have a six myself I have the a screens yeah. um, I have boats too um, but this is what we refer to like this is like the tips and tricks that you can get out of a solver when you're studying with them and then just broken down into easy um, guidelines how to proceed in three bad pots out of position yeah. because blockers are pretty relevant and we know that hearts are absolutely the best combo to bluff with and to barrel with um, and the blocker reasons for our 5-6 suited for example and, and the A6 suited yeah. so yeah that's why I uh, try to want to show this hand because um, this is what uh, we want to showcase in the course as well yeah yeah, for sure, for sure. I think also bet sizing is important, right? As we see preflop out of position, we need to make it a little bit bigger to have some full equity, have some equity denial on the flop. Like you mentioned, we can range bet really small because the yeah, range advantage is huge. And with a lot of his hands, he has to fold, right? No matter um, how um, light he wants to float. And on the turn, different story, we go more polarized. So we need to size up on the turn that we are able to jam river. So yeah. all those concepts are important. It looks easy, right? You always think, well, I play the hand in the same way, but think about it. Would you have really played the hand in the same way or not? Yeah. I also, you have to think about from your opponent's perspective, what are really the blasts we're going to be having on the river, right? Like it's really only the ace and hearts combos and you're not going to be three betting them all 100% frequency preflop because then you would be over bluffing. So yeah, we're gonna have like ace four, ace five hearts, ace eight heart, ace eight hearts, ace nine hearts. Um, but I also really like the ace five and ace four and ace three hearts so much better over let's say ace eight or ace nine because we unblock the sevens to pocket nines um, in case our opponent decides to float twice um, for whatever reason. I think maybe some low frequency defense are gonna be in there on the turn uh, with like eights, nines, sevens i'm not 100 percent sure but sometimes i feel like opponents might be stubborn and just not blocking a seven or eight is also quite beneficial so it's not that we have a lot of bluffs we we can block we can bet jacks with that sizing on the flop so we have jacks we have king jack ourselves we have ace king <clears throat> okay we're probably not shoving ace king for value anymore uh, it's ah, that's, i think I, yeah i think i think i would maybe yeah because um yeah yeah, we, we, we still ahead against King-10, King-Jack, um, something mm -hmm. like King-9 suited might decide to hero call. Um, so we have all the ace-queens, right? And then what are we really bluffing? Yeah. We're not bluffing Queen-10 anymore because we have a bit of shot on value. Um, we're not, we're not going to have like Jack, Queen-Jack or Ace-Jack. We check it on the turn. So I feel like uh, this is also a spot on the, this river um, when you have the King-Queen that you have an easy time folding. I really like this, this approach of showing you okay, what you need to know in order to have, find these bluffs. Because most people on the turn, they're like, oh my God, my ace five and hearts, they would only barrel their natural draw. So they would barrel ace 10, ace queen, queen 10, and maybe some diamond draws. And then on the river, almost everything gets there. And now if they jam, if you have your king queen or you even have your king 10, you can fold on most stakes. Right? Yeah, yeah especially the lower stakes. Yeah. yeah. So, I think this is a is a very good illustration on, um, because you already you already have the idea on the turn that on the queen on a ten when the diamond breaks, um, you wanna, um, you wanna shove right. If he can have ace ten in diamonds, he can have like queen ten diamonds. Um, he can have some queen jack, so he has a lot of auto folds. He has ace five diamonds, perhaps like ace nine diamonds floating the flop. So all these hands, and then again like some tens, nines, eights. So yeah, I, I really like this bluff, and I think this is something where you guys can learn a lot and much more in the course, of course, 
where not only understanding what we need to bluff, but also what is our counter response if we get facing these barriers and we actually get to understand, wow, this is what we're supposed to do. Nobody's doing it. And you're going to have such, so much easier time fooling uh, your bluff catchers. Yeah, for sure. And then it's basically the, th the three-step model we always talk about. Um, what is our opponent like supposed to do? What is he doing in reality or what mm. is he doing wrong? And what is the exploit we have to do? Yeah. That's the king-queen fold on the river, for example, because most of the players on maybe lower stakes are not really able to find enough bluffs for that line, yeah. especially on, on this run out. And then the exploit just is to overfold or to fold all the bluff catchers. And that's where you make the money. So this is the, the three steps um, that we are going through in the course uh, all the time. Yeah. yeah, I think this answer was super crucial because super often you see what is a standard range on the river villain has and they just look, oh, those are my calling frequencies, so I have to call down king nine 100% frequency, right, no matter what. But they never ask, is my opponent really capable of bluff showing all those hands on the river? Is this reality? <laughs> and super often this is not reality, right? In your player pool, people will under bluff in a lot of situations and be aware of this, right? Sometimes you have to fold more from your range. GTO is not always true when yeah. you work with wrong ranges. Yeah. I just realized my cam was also frozen, but doesn't matter. You guys are in the spotlight, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next hand. Um, Ace-Queen against Button with three bet, four X, usually standard sizing out of position. He calls, flop comes Ace-King seven. You decide to bet one third. Would you be uh, sizing your entire range with one third? Would you use different sizings? Would would you be checking a lot? Mm, one sec, where's that? Mm, yes, on the flop, um, definitely range betting is board texture. I mean, this is the best board texture ever for us um, in the small blind when we go ahead and three bet because yeah we have all the nutted hands we have all the aces kings ace king ace queen and our opponent usually only has yeah, a small fraction of ace king and definitely is um, forbidding all his premiums of aces and kings yeah, probably with 100 yeah. percent so we can definitely range bet here and even like uh, in the hand before when he f wants to float really badly with a hand like yeah, pocket force or 10 9 or whatever right not much he can do he's always forced to fold so yeah we can deny a lot of equity um, and we are also able to value bet fairly thin so with a hand like queens or king x right we are still able to value it with the sizing um so why do you um, think you can value bet with queens with that sizing yeah villain still calls with a lot of gross hands right um, villain calls still all the seven x all the gut shots all the flash draws and when we use a really big sizing for example if you bet yeah. pot size he's never going to call a gross hand yeah so the smaller you size, the lighter you can value bet in general. Yeah. And on this board, you don't need a lot of protection apart from the flash draw. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, turn is the three in spades. And yeah, we always have to think about our whole range, right? So how do we like this card? I mean, with ace queen, with the queen in spades, we are not too bad, right? But when we think our, about our whole range, uh, we don't like it too much. We have a lot of um, yeah, good top pairs. We have some two pairs and yeah, not a ton of flushes, but we see that flop. So villain has more flushes than we do. Because yeah. when villain has like um, jack 10 or uh, jack 9 in hearts or something like this, he's folding flop. But when he has jack 9 in spades, he's always calling. So tower card is definitely more favorable for our opponent than for us. And this means, unfortunately, we need to do a lot of checking on the turn. So yes, we still can um, bet a small fraction from our range on the turn if we want to, but we mainly want to do a lot, a lot of checking on the turn because the turn card is so bad for our range in general. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do, right? We check but not, turn. not necessarily bad for our hand since we have the queen and spades, but we need to think of what, what, what are we range, going to be yes. doing if we don't have the queen and spades, right? This is... Um, exactly, like or... ace, queen and hearts. Yeah. Or ace jack and hearts, yeah. or with ace king, or with aces, right? Yeah. We don't like the card so much because now we block nothing. Of course, having ace queen and spade is always good because yeah, we block a lot of made flushes because we have yeah. the queen and spade. Mm. So yeah, we go ahead and check. <clears throat> and villain now decides to bet um, fairly small. Also, a fairly standard could probably go even smaller on the turn. Yeah, on the turn, yeah, nothing else bet. we can do, right? So. Yeah, we have to call. I mean, we are super yeah. um, high up in our range. No, not too many better hands in our turn check range. So we make the call. 
Yeah, river bricks, um, and we check the turn, so it makes no sense to lead now on the river and tell our opponent the story that we have a flush. We don't want to overvalue our hand. So we check again, and Willem rips it for a little bit more than pot size. Yeah. And the question is, should we call here with ace queen or not? And how should we think about those situations in general? And like I mentioned before, we block a lot of mate flushes. We are super high up in our range. When you think about, do I have better hands than ace queen in my turn check hall range? Not so much, right? maybe a few flushes. Um, but besides that, ace queen is super, super, super high up in our range. And we block all the flushes because villain is um, defending pre up all the suited broadways. Um, two or three reds, so we block all the queen 10, queen 9, queen jack suited. We block all those hands. So it's much more likely that our opponent um, rips it with a hand like jacks or he feels like bluffing with a 7. Maybe he's turning a hand like king jack into a bluff at some point in time. So yeah, we have one of the best bluff catches. And when you realize this is usually one of the best hands I arrive on the river with, you just have to click the call button, right? We have a lot of, our opponent can have a lot of bluffs. We are super high up in our range. So yeah, this is the time you have to decide on a call. And here we heroed it off and villain showed, yeah, pocket tens with the ten and spades. So we also had a good blocker um, to the flush. But this is not important. Even if our opponent has a hand like seven, eight in spades, this is still a very profitable river call. So never be results orientated on the output. Think about potential bluffs. And when you think you are super high up in your range, you find enough bluffs and you have um, the needed equity to call and you should make this river call. Yeah. I think it's very important that, okay, he might be shoving a seven, right? Or ace three on the river. So we can yeah, have a four also, ace yeah, king, yeah, right? Ace nine king, yeah. also maybe. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. then he has hands like um, the queen 10 suited, the jack 10 suited, the queen jack suited that can now start bluffing, just wrapping the flush. Um, not only, um, I was yes. pretty surprised by his um, uh, by his hand right now because it makes uh, makes good sense to turn that into a bluff and it's pretty advanced actually. Yeah. Um, there's there's another strategy yeah, possible like for, for this sure. drop. Yeah. You could also argue for um, having a big sizing on ace-king-7 and not betting your whole range and then be very, very polarized because you want to take advantage of the fact that you can have all the ace-kings and kings and aces and ace-queens and your opponent lacks those. And whenever there's a flush draw out there on those yeah. boards that you absolutely smash with your range, there's always like some kind of uh, big sizing going on that's also doable and also possible. Yeah. And then yeah, it's called the babysitter strategy. I will refer to that in the course maybe um, and go a little bit deeper into that. But you can also bet very, very big. And if you want to bet very, very big, then you could put a hand um, like ace queen in there too to get the maximum or one big street of weaker aces yeah. of the king. X. Yeah, yeah. And then you could uh, put yeah, pocket 100%. jacks into your checking range, for example. Because if we think about it, like pocket jacks, pocket queens, betting small on the flop doesn't like accomplish a ton when we think about it yeah but still um yeah there's ba basically like two game yeah. plans going on and on the spade when we have the queen of spades we could also argue for maybe a small block bet to still get value from the king queens with one spade or the ace jacks um still that want to call a small sizing but really really puke against the big one and we don't really want to isolate ourselves against better hands and better holdings but yeah. it would be a possible turn take as well yeah this is also one of the spots yeah river also right we can also go for our three small streets yeah, yeah, for sure. So as you can see, we have so many options, but that's why it's important to simplify in the beginning and see what are solid strategies, what is the solver telling us, and how can we um, include this into our own game plan yeah. and not mix all the five different strategies that we have now together, because then you have no clue, should I bet small, big, everything? This is just way too complicated in the beginning. So yeah, especially when you start out, try to simplify a lot. Yeah. What I also really like about this spot is if you put yourself in button situation and you face a triple barrel on this board and then you have, let's say, ace nine and diamonds, or let's say you have ace eight, you don't have two pair, ace eight suited, you call the three bet, you call the flop, you call the turn, and then he jumps to the river. So very often then we, of course, we, we hate life and we think about what blast can he have. What I see people doing is like, yeah, he can have the queen jacks and jack tens with one spade. But this is not really in their three betting range, right? Like the, the off suited combos. You want to be with 100 big blinds, mostly Correct. three betting the suited combos. So also, this is a spot um, 
it might look at first like an easy spot to have lots of plus on the river, but the way the prefab ranges work, it's actually not. not so sad. your opponent needs to be creative. So as you yep. said, maybe you see bet tens or queens with a small sizing with one spade, right? And then the spade gets there and you start turning your hand into a bluff. You block also very strong calling hands, let's say ace queen, right? If we have queens with one spade, we block ace queen with queen and spades. So we not only blow, do we block the yeah, queen awesome flushes, them. but we also block the, the good bluff catchers. So, yeah. and that's the problem that most players don't think like this on the flop. They're not like, oh, you know, um, maybe on a flush run out, I'm gonna really lacking bluffs because I'm not three betting off suited combos. So I should probably start c betting those tens, jacks and queens. Um, probably there's also like pocket fives with one uh, spade is c betting and then turning it into bluff, right? If we have this as a low three bet frequency preflop or pocket eights or pocket nines. Uh, so these pocket pairs really need to be in their barreling range. I can see, I can see, I see a lot of players just eights, you know, sixes calling preflop, not having in their three betting range, and then also not c betting all the queens to tens. So you can be sure if you face a triple barrel, and I'm pretty sure if you would make a population analysis that on these runouts, it's going to be heavily underbluffed. So just yeah, by sure. just by connecting here the dots with, yeah. okay, the way we're supposed to three bet, and then what we're supposed to do on the flop, um, where, as I said earlier, ace, king, seven, I have queens, jacks, okay, let's start with a check. Well, then on a flush run out, you're basically never going to have any bluffs that you can use because you're never going to have a hand that just has one spade that you can bluff with. Yeah. And then if we think about it again, that would require exactly. so much this... knowledge that you have all those bluffs on those runouts. Yeah. And basically, the lower you go onto the ladder, the less likely it is to happen. Yeah. And the more you can overfold in practice. Yeah. Great hand, great hand. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, where's the 6-5 suited? Here we go. So UTG raises, you three bet from the cutoff with 6-5 suited. Uh, is it a standard three bet for you? Uh, yes, um, slow, low frequency, like 25% of the time, especially okay. against the early position, the very small suited connectors such as 5-4 to 8-7 uh, roundabout work a little bit better because under the gun is supposed to fold pocket fives, pocket sixes, pocket sevens, which is really great for my hand. Mm -hmm. And it has this cool nut cracking ability against a strong range, a strong defending range. Yeah. Um, so this is why uh, sometimes these very low suited connectors are in there. Um, it is in the preflop game plan for the course as well. Um, Sometimes you um, need to play those, although it's uh, another reason would be board coverage. Yeah. If there's a low board, like four, six, seven, you want to have some yeah. connectivity. Um, you want to flop some straights on those boards. And that's basically why these hands are in yeah. there. And once, if we have only one combo, like 25% of the time, there are four combos of six, five suited. You pick one to three bet, maybe... Um, you like hearts, so then you pick hearts for um, randomizing a little bit. And once you get four of it, um, you can't fold because you don't have all the four combos. Uh, you just have one, and then you call that to a four bet um, for the same reason you three bet pre board yeah. coverage and nut cracking ability. Okay. Yeah. Well, not, not maybe just to, to elaborate on that, not, because mm. why six five suited so much better in terms of nut uh, cracking ability than let's say ten nine suited. Oh yeah, because you never dominated. Um, because the under the gun player um, will um, four bet as a bluff, some ace tens, um, some pocket tens, uh, some uh, pocket jacks, uh, and you are very less likely to um, have the problem of having or just pocket kings, or, which we sometimes yeah. need for a straight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to make the <laughs> and yeah. then, but like he's never going to be four betting a hand that interferes with our six five, right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe an ace five suited, but he's never going to have a seven, an eight, a four, a three. Very, yes, very rarely. Exactly. Like he's never going to be forming with, with yeah. two sevens. Yeah. But and that's also the reason why we never have eight, nine suited, for example, in this scenario. We never three bet that. And if we three bet, we never call the four bet because mm -hmm. if the lob comes down like queen, 10, jack, um, we are like beat by all the ace kings that are like the yeah. high frequency four bets. And this is basically the reason why eight, seven, six, five, and six, seven is in there, four, five suited two, and eight, nine is never in there. Just. Yeah. yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, also very important to understand, right? It's just the, these card removal effects that our opponents first, and also against his calling range, right? If you have 10-9 suited or 9-8 suited, he's going to be calling 10s, 9s, 8s, jack-10 suited. So we are not doing so well in a three-bet pot. 
But then at some point, like 7-8 suited, 6-7 suited, it gets further away from the hands he's defending and unblocking the outs we need in order to make a straight, a strong hand. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and what I also really like about your guys' approach is, and I'm pretty sure you mentioned that in the course, is yes, this is the solid game plan. But of course, if you feel like someone is not folding a lot against three bets or maybe you have a weak opponent in the blinds, uh, you should probably not be three betting in the first place. You just call, try to get the blinds. And also, it really hurts you if then the player behind you is cold calling you through with ace nine suited, right? Because you don't generate that full yeah. equity that you <laughs> that you need. I had this actually yeah. also on stream on Sunday in the Venom America's card room, and it's actually I think it's it's way softer than all the other sides. And there was a guy to my left. And after the third time, and I kept three betting my Jack ten suited, Queen ten suited. And the moment I three bet for the third time, I'm like Ben, you fucking idiot! What are you actually doing? This guy to your left is calling all your three bets. He's never falling, and he was cold calling my three bets three times. And yeah. then after that, I essentially I never bluff three bet anymore. I just called if I had a strong hand, I three bet because this guy he had a hard time folding. So I was pretty sure he's, this is the type of player if he has his a7 suited he wants to see a flop and you were super deep as well especially in cash games where there's no tournament lives you're gonna have these opponents it's, or if yeah, you play live all cash the time game, yeah. yeah so this all is something time. you need to pay attention you need to have a good note system tagging system if you see uh, some some callings preflop calling stations post up calling stations you need to shift your game plan from okay three betting gto to just three betting very very good hands and just calling the rest yeah for sure um yeah, cause I think this is a little bit different now. Cause back in the days, even regulars were overfolding all the time, right? So you can through it a bunch. People were folding like seventy yeah, percent through it. Yeah, yeah. But nowadays it's different. Everyone has a clue. Oh, um, he can through it light. So no one is basically overfolding. But there are still a lot of fun players, right? That just want to play poker and have a good time. And of course, when you realize that it makes not a lot of sense to yeah, through it with very weak hands, because there's no full equity preflop, you don't need board coverage or anything like this against very weak opponents. You just threw at your top range and you're good to go. Yeah, absolutely. So then we call the four bet flop. Yeah. It goes check. You decide to check back. Yeah, um, I think it's uh, like. If, if we see a flop, if we look at both ranges, like he has all the ace queens, um, which is like um, the, his best bluff basically because it has so good blockers and ace queen off doesn't really play super amazing as a call preflop. So you use it as a forward bluff. Um, so he has, uh, and I only have the suited combos because ace queen off, I don't really really peel in those positions and play post flop for the same reasons. Yeah. Um, I rarely have nines um, and I have uh, my pocket queens that don't want to stack off preflop. Uh, and that's basically it. And then I have some connect between the queen and the nine with some gut shots king jack suited um jack 10 suited sometimes some Suits. flush shots and that's basically it and then he has all the kings the aces um the pocket queens so this is a spot where can where he can just range bet and make my life really really hard and when people skipping those range bets like those easy ah i'm gonna win anyway i can just bet all my hands like even if i have ace five in diamonds i can just i mean he can't have that because i have the five in diamonds but you get the point right he yeah. can just click 33 percent or even 25 percent and win the pot often enough from me because i can't really defend because he can bet like one dollar and i fold my six five suited here yeah. um so <laughs> yeah and then if it doesn't happen this should always like ringing some alarm bells because he's now deviating from the general game plan he should have so he's basically doing something different and if he, if he does that i'm allowed to do something different too um so now i can basically play against what i think he's doing and don't have to play um like a solid base gto strategy anymore yeah. um my hand if we put it on uh, uh, on paper doesn't really do well because I don't have a backdoor flush draw. I only improve on an eight and a seven and this will be only a gut shot. I don't have any blockers to value hands and I don't really have any kind of overcard. So I, I'm a little bit handcuffed and just have to take the check and uh, hope that I hit a five on the turn that he has ace king and that I can get to showdown. on. That's basically the miracle, right? Yeah. Um, so it goes check, check, um, turn the same game. Basically, um, he, I expect a lot of betting, even if he has pocket jacks and wanted to pot control the flop, he should start betting. Now I'm getting value from my tens, from my, um, nine X maybe, um, from my, all the suited hands. Um, the I can eight, have seven, uh, the, seven, six suited, as you ex mentioned. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and still, I think, um, if he deviates and still skips the betting, um, 
I'm kind of suspicious what's happening. So either he has like a total give up that can, I can still bluff him bluff on, off the on the river. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sense, yeah. Or this is some kind of weird trappy value heavy yeah. hand range kind of yeah. thing. Uh, and I'm basically drawing that if I don't yeah. make my seven. Yeah. Um, so I decided to check again, uh, hit the gin card on the river and face a very big river bed. So at this point, I'm fairly, fairly sure uh, my opponent like had some kind of trap or some kind of um, value hand that he wants to bet big for you now to make up for his missed bets on the flop on the turn. Um, and I think I have a pretty clear value gem. I think my opponent could have a hand like ace king of clubs, which would make some sense to check twice because... Um, I can't really have um, so many weaker flush drop that he can cooler. He has mm. some showdown value. Um, so maybe I look in, in like one or two nut flush combos here when I value jam. But I think all the other hands, the pocket queens, um, the aces, maybe with the ace of clubs and the ace of hearts uh, would be possible. Or the ace queens or king queens yeah. that bluffed preflop are not going to fold now. Yeah. So I jam for that. I really like, uh, I would really like, I, I, I see that very rarely, but I think it's extremely powerful to push your non showdown winnings. If you yeah. have ace king in this on clubs, if you for whatever reason you decide to check on the flop, I think it's a very sexy turn check shove because you start betting now your um, some some hands for protection, right? Or you start yeah, everything that beats ace king basically. Yeah, yeah you start betting jacks, you yeah. start betting tens, you start betting yeah. a nine, um, some random steps, yeah, even eight you eights. know? Yeah. yeah. So and then you face a jam and you're going to be like well he can still have aces kings but and even against the flush throws right and you charge you get that extra money so th the problem is if you bet and he calls he calls all these hands so you not make him fold and you can't really bluff with your clubs on the river unless you exactly. prove but like you get the money from those hands plus you make them fold plus you get exactly. extra money from um yeah, a random step, like a, let's say an ace five, right? In diamonds that yeah. decides oh, to. Oh, the ace ten suited. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because exactly. it's hard to reach the showdown yeah. with ace king, right? Because if you bet yeah. river again, not yeah. much you can do usually. Yeah. So I, I really like these, these delays. But I think also flop alone is interesting, right? What we can learn about here um, that it's so much easier for villain to just range bet, take mm -hmm. the money. Because as we see here, right? He just lost 100, 100 bigs playing um, super tricky. Um, and we also learned that when we have nothing on the flop, Willem plays yeah, a weird line and yeah, we have six high. This is not the time you should start bluffing. Yeah. Super often you hear those theory theories that with six high, when you have nothing on the flop, you can just start betting because otherwise you're not winning mm -hmm. the hand. But this is usually not how you want to approach those spots. In general, the idea is usually if you have nothing, check flop, bet turn. If you pick up equity, when you see enough full equity, if not bluff river, but yeah. not bluff flop, bluff turn, yeah. show river against the top range. This is not how we want mm -hmm. to approach those, those spots. Yeah, that's very good input for a lot. I also think that if we decide to check to, to, to bet the flop, I think also with ace king clubs or ace king hearts, we have a very nice check shove on the turn. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's also very play independent, especially against some people that like to step. You know, they kind of like, they kind of they're kind of sticky. So whenever I play against opponents, when we talk about okay, people always ask me, Ben, what kind of exploits are you making against someone that is sticky? Just very practical. It, it doesn't happen always, but in case I get into that situation, just to give an illustration, I keep doing my range bets, but then I start check shoving a lot of my draws. You know, especially against opponents, you know, he makes a very loose float with king. So he, they're more sticky pre-flop, maybe even calls your forward with ace check off, especially for those guys who um, are might playing more tournaments. You know, sometimes there's a lot of ego involved. So you are not going to, you, you're losing a little bit of EV with your bluffs, even though you have a draw. So yeah. a very good counter exploit is to to really fast play your, your draws, to go for check shafts, to go for like, it's not a big bluff, but like to go for huge bluffs in these spots um, because they, they don't really like giving up pots. They like to float, they like to stab a lot. And that's a very powerful strategy against these opponents. Just, yeah, you know, do a little bit less of yeah. random bluffing, like maybe skip your ace five and diamonds here against these type of opponents, but really hammer it in with your with your strong draws. Yeah, uh, and don't get me wrong, um, it's it's completely fine when you play like 
every day against each other, which is the case mm. in the in the Zoom pools, the 200 Zoom, the 500 Zoom pools. Or um, even like on, on 20, NL25 all. or NL10, you Zoom there as yeah. well, right? And you're going to encounter yeah. the same players at some point over and yeah. over again. It's, it's, it's fine to mix it up. It's fine to like throw a curveball from time to time yeah. to check a strong hand and don't be like predictable. Um, but what I wanted to mention or why this hand is here is not to show um, how it can go wrong, basically, and yeah. tap myself on the back. It's more like that we have our game plan, our like GTO game plan, but once the player pool is deviating or doing something clearly wrong or very, very far away from the um, from the normal game plan, that we are allowed to deviate as far as well. Yeah. So we can just yeah throw a curveball back and uh, don't have to do things based on our game plan. Uh, and we can just yeah do basically whatever fits best for the situation and start exploiting our player pool. Yeah. I just see, wow, he even at the Ace, Ace King clubs, he must be like, what yeah, does pretty this good guy picture. have? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you can't afford that. It's 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 yeah. just too, too, too difficult. Also, what yeah, yeah. you guys need to keep in mind, and it's good that you brought it up, that when you when you end up being in a game tree that you're not supposed to be in, so let's say this is a range seabed board, and he checks, very often I see people getting very aggressive. You don't need to be, because you're already gaining XIV by seeing free cards right yeah exactly you, yeah realizing yeah. equity yeah i mean how, how much equity do you have probably like two three percent you need to hit runner runner perfectly right or runner, runner. yeah exactly and but, that yeah. that i'm yeah allowed to do that it's just a uh, amazing uh, ev game for me <laughs> yeah i mean let's say for simplification two percent right um so it's like 80 cents of a mistake there's like 80 cents if you if if we say okay two to three percent let's say a dollar a dollar of a mistake mm -hmm. um it doesn't sound a lot but you will see that in a lot of spots also in position where people don't see oh my god this is a spot where it's supposed to be range c betting you usually end up being very passive in these spots because then also if you look in pio we're not supposed to do then a lot of stabbing here or supposed to do a lot of leading on turns when we're out of position it's actually, it also has helped me to cool down. It's like, all right, I saw an extra free card, which I'm not supposed to see. It's great. Like, let's say I play this board as the big blind and I hit my, I have my four do student and defend from the big blind and he's supposed to do lots of large sizing and I should have folded. And it's usually I check, check and like, the turn is an eight and then he bets one third. I'm like, yeah, but I have a pair. He could have blocked. I just folded. Like I know I already made so much more V by exactly. seeing another card where I can hit one of my five outs to make trips or um, two pair. And this is something where people get caught up. Oh, I need to bluff now. Oh, sometimes the board is not favor. If he checks back, just be grateful for seeing the free card for free or the turn card for free. And uh, yeah, you, you don't need to apply any kind of fancy strategies. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on this. Yeah, you actually. Even, what just happens is that you. If you, we change. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, even if yeah. we change um, our whole cards, right? Even if we say we have like Jack Ten and Diamonds, so we have an open and a straight draw. Mm -hmm. Even then, it's totally legit to check it's flop super, when we think yeah. villain's range yeah. is way stronger than usual because we realize free equity. And if we bet, let's say we bet thirty bucks, villain rips it. What do you do now? Yeah, I mean that's just usually the, that, that's usually equity. the thing, like, right? That's usually the thing where people start playing trappy. It's like, okay, I want to mix in some traps because they don't understand that they can actually bet everything because, oh, I have to have give ups. So I need to balance my range. So they mix in traps. Uh, and that's exactly. Yeah. So yeah. what you would do now with Jack 10 is basically um, giving up that EV that you additionally gain because then you're going to be facing those check jams. You're going to bluff him out of the, of the pot on the river anyway. If he has his ace five diamond or his random give up, you can bluff against those hands on the river, as you said, yeah. right? You're running into a trap or Correct. you're running into a bluff. But if you run into trap, you bet fold a very high equity hand that could crack his nuts, his, his yeah. you know, ace king and hearts, or sorry, ace king and clubs, or his ace queen, his pocket queens or pocket nines or whatever it is. Okay, pocket nines might not yeah. be four betting, but you get the point, yeah. right? So something you, you always have to take into consideration. Usually passive line in these spots is, a super, super strong um, counter strategy as an exploit. Great guys, um, so much value in here. I'm pretty sure that the community is gonna be appreciating it. You wanna share any last words about the course, about what is coming up, anything that I have missed, what you think is important to know when it comes to that release. 
Hmm. Um, I would say um, another benefit of the course or another um, maybe reason why it's um, I, I don't want to say I would don't want to use the word better but um, why it's like beneficial why can it be really really good is the experience um, Fallout and me have as coaches we basically have seen everything there is we had students who were like praying like playing crazy maniac style 40 30 20 <laughs> style uh, and we and we had guys who were like 17 6 2 and was like okay why why are you not playing the game why are you afk all the time waiting for aces <laughs> to get it into kings uh, mm -hmm. we had it all and we had like basically every leak there is for those stakes and for everyone who wants to move up and if we don't have the league you think you have we might head it ourselves in our careers i struggled myself with cash games over and over in all of these standard spots and i had to relearn my game plan from the scratch yeah uh, i struggled in three bad pots with my red line c bedding barreling blocker effects everything um i had to do uh, i had to do it um fallout had to do it um we, we've seen so much stuff that we put all the problems basically in one bag and try to make like a solution or a pretty good guideline at least, a pretty good, be a good study partner for someone who buys the course and looks for the solution to their leaks and problems. That's what we want to do and what we want to create. Who yeah, do you 100%. think? And also, we see the leaks every single day in Discord, right? We are every single day in Discord, in the Razor Edge Discord. We try to help the users there. And yeah, it's still the same problems over and over again. Like you already mentioned, red line, exploit versus GTO, thread pots, preflop ranges, preflop ranges, preflop ranges. It's always the same problems. Uh, and we have a very good idea how they look like and how to encounter those problems. Great. That's what makes this duo so powerful. You guys not only know the shit in theory, but you've also seen that in practice. And I think I've seen that. Uh, for myself that once i started coaching and working with students i felt that my ability to <clears throat> share my knowledge also got significantly better because i needed to adjust okay what do people need and yeah. that's why this course is going to be epic and i'm really excited to get it out there uh, well, who yeah, do you think this course is made for? for for what for what stakes is this course made for so the preflop game plan is suitable for all stakes because it's just based on Monka Solver outputs and it's simplified to be uh, executable in game very, very easy. Mm -hmm. So these will be like everlasting preflop ranges. You can use up to, I don't know, 500 zoom um, or even like if you go above that, then let us know. That would be crazy cool. Yeah. Um, and the post flop content is designed for um, simplifying and basically for everyone who goes from low stakes to mid stakes or for the super beginners too, who just want to get uh, a little bit more knowledge about the game and move from like the micros and the very beginning steps to the next step and then to the next step, I would say. Great. Fun fact at the end, when we had the meeting today at 6.30, everyone, as we're all German, in six, at 6.6.30, 6 hi, yeah, let's shop. go. <laughs> so you <laughs> get German, German precision in that course. You don't want to miss that out. Thank you guys so much. 100%. It was a pleasure. Looking forward. And if you guys have any other questions in the comments, let us know. Yeah, We're definitely. happy to answer. And everything that you need to know, we're going to put in the description. Hope you guys enjoyed that piece of content and looking forward to the release. See you guys next time. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. And thank you to follow bye -bye. and yeah. Code Smile bye -bye. for taking the time joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.